When I'm low in spirit, I cry, Lord, lift me up. I want to go higher with Thee. But the Lord knows I can live on a mountain. So we picked out. Let's take our Bibles, turn to Psalm 10, Psalm number 10. I'm going to give you a long introduction, a short message, and a long closing. How about that? <laughs> Psalm 10. And in just a minute, we'll get back there. But I want to uh, remind you that, uh, that God is going to judge this world one of these days. The Bible says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that, the judgment. After this, the judgment. First time you have that word judge is found in uh, Genesis chapter 15 and verse number one and verse number 14. The Bible told uh, Moses that God, or the Bible told Moses, God told Moses that he was going to judge Egypt. He was going to judge Egypt and he, and he did. In fact, he sent plagues into Egypt and so forth. And then uh, later on in Genesis chapter 18, uh, God said that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, Lord, you mean to tell me you would destroy the righteous with the wicked? And, and uh, then Abraham began to say, you know, if you can find, if, if there's 50 righteous in that city, would you withhold your judgment? God said, I won't destroy it for 50's sake. And then it came on down and he kept whittling the numbers down, 40 and 30 and so forth. And uh, couldn't even find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what? Uh, but Abraham said, shall not the God of all the earth do right. He's going to, he judged. The Bible says God is the judge of all the earth and shall he not do right. Now, whatever God does with what judgment God meets out, I'm telling you, he's going to be fair. He's going to be right. Then in Judges chapter number 11, verse 21, the Bible says the Lord is the judge. For Samuel 2, 10, the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. Hebrews 12 and 23 said that God is the judge of all. 
Now, when we look especially in the Old Testament, it seems like when you come to the New Testament that God has transferred his judgment and given it to his son. And uh, so in John chapter number five, I want to read a couple of verses there. John chapter five, verse number 22. You might want to jot these down or come back to it later on. John chapter number five and verse number 22. The Bible says, for the father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the son. And then in verse number 30, I can, Jesus speaking, I can have my own self do nothing as I hear I judge my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the father, which has sent me. So John chapter five, Jesus is judge. God has committed God, the father committed all judgment to his son. And may I remind you that Paul talks about the judgment seat of who Christ. Not the judgment seat of the Lord, not the judgment seat of God, <clears throat> but the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll look at that in just a little bit. And then think about these verses. In Acts chapter 10, verse number 42, the Bible says, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he, that's Jesus, which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. Then in Acts 17, 31, because he, that's God, hath appointed a day in which he, God, will judge the world in righteousness by that man, and that man is Jesus, whom he hath ordained. Romans 2, 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Timothy tells us the same thing. So it seems that God has transferred the, the uh, right, if I could use that word, of judgment and has given it to his son. Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 10 says, And they cried with a loud voice saying, O Lord. Now when you find the word Lord in the Bible with a capital L and the lowercase letters O-R-D, that speaks of Jesus. When you find it all capitals, that really speaks of God the Father in most cases. So they cried with a loud voice saying, O Lord, capital L, small case letters O-R-D, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. And uh, I saw heaven open, night, chapter 19, verse 11. Behold, a white horse, he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. Now, I want to give you two scriptures here to look at. And then we'll go to Psalm 10, okay? And then I'll give you the title, all right? What we're going to talk about. You say we're going to talk about judgment. Well, how did you guess? Romans 2. Let's go to Romans 2, if you would. Romans chapter number two. Romans chapter number two, look at verse number one. Romans two, verse one. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou shalt, or thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now watch verse three. And thinkest thou this O man that judgest them which do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. So there's nobody is going to, nobody's going to escape the judgment of God. In fact, the Bible says in Jude 15 that all are going to be judged. Now, back to Psalm 10. I'm going to give you the title of the message. The title of the message is Judge Jesus. You're thinking of Judge Judy. No, we're not talking about Judge Judy. We're talking about Judge Jesus, all right? Father, please help us as we look at this particular subject. Help us to realize, Father, that every man, woman, boy, girl will stand and give an account of ourselves. Lord, we pray that you'll help us um, to glean, to gather that which you have given us today. May we not have just another service. May this not just be another Sunday. But Father, help us to realize this is very important what we're doing today. We ask, dear God, that you help us to see that. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at Psalm 10. I want to look at verse 11, 12, and 13. Psalm 10. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. 
Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. Look at verse 13. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? Hath he said in his heart, thou wilt not, or he hath said in his heart, thou wilt not require it. Now, I'm going to talk about Jesus being the judge. And here, he's going to warn the unbeliever who thinks he'll be excused. Who thinks he'll be excused. You know, a lot of people don't even think about Jesus, first of all. And they certainly don't think about him being a judge, secondly. But his, his past is not going to be excused. Look what he says in verse number 11. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. Can you imagine somebody making that brazen statement to say that God has forgotten? Now, we have forgotten. We forget a lot of things. But I promise you this, God has not forgotten anything. He never will, never has. God hath forgotten. Now, I'm glad that, well, I got to say this. I got to say this. I got to back up a little bit. When you get saved, God has forgiven you of your sins. But in some strange way that only God can do it, he has forgotten those sins too. Amen? And uh, so thank God for that. So I had to back up a little bit. Now, so his, his past won't be excused. Look what he says. He says, this sinner says, this unbeliever says that God hath forgotten. Look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Just go a few pages ahead. You'll find Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And look at chapter number three. So, uh, Ecclesiastes is uh, Nancy Pelosi's favorite book. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter number three. <laughs> Verse number 15. Verse number, I started once to look at some verses in here and kind of take them out of context and apply them to Nancy, and, but I did. I, chapter 3. <laughs> look at chapter 3, verse number 15. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. Now watch this. And God requireth that which is past. You see that? Moreover, he says, <clears throat> I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. You see that? Judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose, for every work. Now, here's a person in Psalm 10 that says, God has forgotten. God has forgotten my past. I promise you, God has not forgotten the past. The record book is going to be open one of these days and God's going to go through them, examine them thoroughly. I've heard people say, but I made a resolution. I turned over a new leaf. I've got a little bit morality, got a little bit religion. I've changed my ways. You know, that's, that's all well and good, but what about your past? You may have started today. You may have started a week ago and said, you know what? I'm changed. I've turned over a new leaf. I've done all these things, got a little religion, started going to church and everything. But your past is still has to be accounted for. Amen. And the only one that can have their past accounted for and forgiven and wiped away is for, or is for that unbeliever to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I, I trust you. I repent of my sins. Come into my life. I receive you as my Savior. And I'm telling you, at that moment, God wipes away your past. But until that time, your past is still required. So here's a person that says, God's forgotten. My past goes, look, God goes further back than your past, by the way. And so uh, God's going to call our past to account. And <clears throat> no man can escape judgment by making resolutions or even by keeping resolutions. Now let's look at another thing here in verse number 11. God has said in his heart, God hath, for, or he hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. Now, look, look at something else here. In uh, his past won't, won't be excused, but his present is considered. Now, look what else he said. He goes from his past to his present. He says, he hideth, that's present tense, he hideth his face. He will never see it. Now, here is a man, unbeliever, of course, and he thinks that God is either morally blind or limited in his knowledge. You know, say, unsaved people has a strange, strange idea of who God is. In fact, they make up their own God. 
That way they can justify what they're doing. And they'll say something like this. Well, God understands. How do you know? You don't even know God. And so we got people, unbelievers, who are saying, I'm okay to do this. I'm okay to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. What does God say about it? Well, his, his present is in consideration. Look at Psalm 34, verse number 15. Psalm 34, verse number 15. Verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are, are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is, not was, not will be, is, present tense, is against them that do evil. Right now. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Thank God for that verse. So here, here an, an unbeliever says, you know what? God doesn't know anything about my past. He's forgotten. And God doesn't, you know, he, he's hiding his face. He doesn't, he doesn't see what I'm doing right now. Well, the Bible says over in Hebrews 4 and 13, I like this verse. Let me read it for you. Hebrews 4, 13. The Bible says, verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the designing uh, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow is a discerner and thoughts and intents of the heart. You know what this Bible does? It gets to your insides. <laughs> Amen. It gets to your mind. It gets to your heart. You know, people want to conform on the outside morally. You know, I've done this. I quit smoking. I quit drinking. I've started doing this. and all. But that Bible goes right inside of your heart and right inside of your mind. And so the Bible says, the Word of God says, that God's Word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Look, verse 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. He doesn't see me. Oh, yeah, he does. This psalmist writes about this fellow, this lost fellow, and he says, uh, he, he says, God hideth his face, and he'll never see what I'm doing. He'll never see it. Yes, he will. I, it can be pitch black, pitch dark. It can be in, in some secret place. Do you think nobody else is looking, but God sees. God sees all. The Bible says there's not a creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto him, uh, unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He sees the sins of the heart and of the mind and of the attitude and the spirit. So while we sit here on a Sunday morning and says, I really don't want to be here, God sees that. Your thoughts are, look, your thoughts may be kept inside, but they're speaking loudly in the ears of God. God knows whether you want to be here or not. And some people are just bold enough to show it. <laughs> Where are you out there? <laughs> Amen. Well, not only his past won't be excused. We're talking about an unbeliever. And his present is taken into consideration. But what about his future? Look at verse number 13. He talks about his future here. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? He has said in his heart, thou wilt not require it. Thou wilt not require it. The word contemn is a strange word. It may not condemn, but contemn. It means to drive away. It means to despise or to consider and treat as mean and despicable. And so this unbeliever says, wherefore that the wicked contemn God, he said in his heart, that will not require it. You say, well, yeah, but God is love. I've heard people say, well, God is love. And I, I know I haven't been perfect and he might, he might punish me, but certainly he loves me enough that he would not send one of his children to hell. He doesn't send any of his children to hell. You don't become a child of God until you become born again. Just because you live in America. That doesn't make you a child of God. I'm, I'm, cons I'm considering moving. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Hey, look, we're going to move one of these days. Amen. And they can have this thing. Well, God is love. Is that the kind of thinking that, a, that an unbeliever has? He thinks that way. Look, he thinks that God's not watching. God doesn't have anything to do with my past. He, he's hiding his face from my present. And he's not going to require me to answer for all of my sins. Look, what book have you been reading? God will require. The Bible says nothing. Listen to me. The Bible says nothing about probation. 
The Bible says nothing about purgatory. But the Bible does say something about eternal punishment. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, the Lord said in Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 46. So we have in Psalm 10, we have a warning to the unbeliever who thinks he'll be excused. But then when we come to the believer, now we're talking about judgment. Look, the, the believer's going to be judged too, aren't we? And so there's a warning to believers who think that they will not be examined. <laughs> We're all going to be examined. Amen. Let's look at two passages of scripture and then I'm going to bring you something interesting. And, and the Bible is interesting, but give you something a little bit on top of this. Second Corinthians chapter five. You know what that verse says, but I'm going to read it just to get familiar with it again. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse number 10. The Bible says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. One day, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, God is going to sift and weigh every thought and every motive and every word and every action. God knows it all. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, another verse that goes right along with this. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Look at verse number 13, if you would. 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 13. Verse 13 says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be received by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what, not what size, but what sort. You know, the Bible says that God's going to look upon that. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. You know, there's a description in the book of the Revelation that says that Jesus has eyes as of flaming fire. You ever have anybody just to look right through you? Oh, man. Can you imagine what that day is going to be? This, look, our works, what we do, our motives, our desires, all of these things as Christians now, we're not talking about lost people, we done took care of that. But we're going to be judged by the ever seeing, all knowing Jesus Christ who has those eyes that are as a flame of fire. Look what else he says in verse number 14. Or verse number, I'm sorry, verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Well, I'm glad I'm saved. Because I guarantee you, look, I don't think I'm by myself here on this, but I guarantee you that I've got some works that are going to be tried by fire, and they're going to be burned up. I don't like to say that. I do not delight in saying that. In fact, I'm ashamed to say that. But the truth is truth. Amen. It's going to be a judgment. It's not going to be a jamboree. For the Christian who takes this judgment lightly, I'm going to, I want you to consider this. Now, listen to what I'm about to say. Suppose, are you, are you saved? Yeah. All right. If you're saved, we're going to heaven. But we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We are going to give an account of what we've done in his body. Our works are going to be judged. We're, we're, we're going to either have rewards or we're going to have a loss of rewards. But thank God we're going to still be saved. We're not going to lose our salvation. You can't do that. But suppose you were to sin in word. Anybody ever sin in word in here? Sure, we all have. You ever sinned in thought? Probably more than in word. What about attitude? We ever send an attitude, just our attitude. And I just, I'm sick and tired of going, going to church. <laughs> That's a bad attitude, amen? Attitude, action. What, what, what if we, look, what if you sin? By the way, I had a guy one time, we was having, <clears throat> I know you, you said, uh, I need some water, man. <laughs> anyway, put a little bit of coffee in it while you're at it. 
I can remember we had a men's prayer meeting before service started, and we were all praying, and so-and-so's turn was to pray, and he, he said, I thank you, Lord, I hadn't sinned today. And uh, I'm thinking, what? I didn't say anything. But let, let's just suppose. Can we suppose this morning? Let's just suppose that you were to sin, whether in word or thought or deed or attitude, just one time a day. If you just sin one time a day, guess what? In one week, you've only committed seven sins. Well, wouldn't that be something? I was getting ready to say, wouldn't that be good? But no sin is good, amen. In, in, in one year, you would sin, we're, we're talking about Christians now, <clears throat> you would sin 365 times in a year. You think anybody in here could do that? I don't think so. In 10 years, you would have sinned 3,650 times in 10 years. In 50 years, if you just sin one time a day, in 50 years, you would have sinned 18,250 times. Thank you, Logan. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody need baptized? <laughs> anyway. All right, where was I? I probably just sinned. <laughs> All right. All right, so you say, that's a lot of sin. It is in 50 years. But one sin's a lot of sin. One sin is. But suppose you would sin just once an hour. Let's just move it up a little bit. Once an hour. Once a day is too many times. You know, uh, the epistle of John, John writes, These things write I unto you that ye sin not. And he says, and if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So thank God we have, I'm telling you what, Christians are keeping Jesus busy. Think about that. All right, you sin once an hour. <clears throat> in one day, how many? 24, 24 sins in one day. One week, 168. One year, 8,736. Year's time. Now look, if you just sin one time an hour in a year's time, you have sinned 8,736. In 10 years, 87,360. In 50 years, you would have sinned 436,800 times. Now, wait a minute. The Bible says... <clears throat> For all have sinned, but here's the next part of it, and <laughs> come short of the glory of God. Now, we hadn't taken that coming short part in here. But let's just say, not only do all sin, we've all, the Bible says, we've all come short of the glory of God. Is it fair to say that we all come short of the glory of God at least once a minute I thought about this you know what that, that word that phrase means you come short of the glory of God you know who the glory of God is it's Jesus do you think that in a minute's time that we come short of being like Jesus in a minute I think so I think it's fair to say that we have so not only have we sinned, but we've come short of the glory of God. So we move it up again. Once a minute. Once a minute. In a day's time, that's 1,440 sins. Wow. And these people have the nerve to say, well, I haven't sinned today. You've sinned every minute. <laughs> and in a day's time. Well, I'd like to have these figures before me when talking to somebody like that. So, no, no, wait a minute. Here's what... <laughs> In a week's time, 10,080 sins in a week's time. In a year's time, 524,160. In 10 years' time, 5,241,600. That's a lot of sinning going on. But 50 years, 
the grand total is 26,000. No, I'm sorry, 26 million 208,000. Now, why do you bring all this stuff? I'm telling you because we make light of sin as Christians. We look at the church as if if I have time, I'll go. We look at the Bible as if, if I have time, I'll read it. And I got too much to do, Lord, to pray. I'm telling you, that's, that's sin. And ladies and gentlemen, if we, if we would just sin one time a day, too many. If we would sin one hour, too, too much. Look, every Christian should live every moment of every hour of every day as if he or she were on the brink of judgment. Man, I'm just telling you, we, we're just playing around too much as Christians, as Christians. No wonder the lost world looks at churches, makes fun of them. No wonder the lost world looks at Christians and just has a good, good old time with making light of God. I, it, it, it is not going to be a, it's not going to be a joyous time when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. It's not until we come to the book of Revelation, God makes us a new people, that he's going to wipe away all tears. I think there's going to be a lot of tears shed at the judgment seat of Christ. I think there's going to be quite a lot of tears from yours truly at the judgment seat of Christ. I read this just the other day that one man said, the closer that you get to God, the more aware of sin in your life. You used to have an old fella at Red Star Missionary Baptist Church by the name of Johnny Hickenbottom. Johnny couldn't read, <clears throat> but he carried a Bible with him. He wanted to let everybody know that whose side he was on. White hair old man. He, he could not pronounce his words too good. But I'm telling you, that man loved God. And every time a preacher would get up and the invitation was given, he would walk down that aisle and hit that altar and pray, cry out to God. And as a kid, I didn't understand that. As a kid, I thought, man, he must be a big old sinner going to the altar all the time. But I never understood what I understand now is that the closer that you get to God, the more aware of sin that you are in your life. Amen? Let's do it like one old preacher said. Let's keep short accounts with God. Don't let them pile up. When the Holy Ghost of God lets you know, I'm not pleased with that, hit your knees if you can. Confess it. Forsake it. Get right with God. Amen? Our churches have lost its power because we're making light of the judgment seat of Christ. I really believe that. Let's get back to where we need to be. Amen? Father, please help us. Dear God, I have to confess, Lord, that there are times when I don't think much or don't think often of the judgment seat of Christ. In our lives, I believe we're guilty of just going through a day without not even thinking about Jesus, what he's done. Oh God, may we draw nearer the cross. May we seek to be at your feet quite often. Lord, we need you. We ask your God that you'll help us as we realize that just any day you could come. We believe we're seeing things happen that on this earth that we've never happened. That's never happened before that we've never seen before. And we believe that the coming of your son is very, very close. And being of such that it is close, what manner of persons that we ought to be. So help us, Lord. There's need, if there's one here that needs to be saved, would you save them? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. You can live as you please, but you must pay the cost. And the highway to heaven still goes by the cross.
wrong. 